What's going on, NBA Draft fans? It's your boy, Corey Tulliba, the NBA Draft Dude, the Wolf of Ball Street, hitting you today with Big Board Update 2. It's been about two months since the last time I gave you my top 30 player rankings, so I figured, post-March Madness, what better time than now to give you an update and talk about my 30 favorite prospects in the 2022 NBA Draft. I'll also say that this board is fluid, as always, and by the time we get to draft night, it's probably gonna look a little bit different than it does now. And you know what? I think it's time. Let's get it started. At number 30, I have Jalen Williams out of Santa Clara. That's right. Jalen Williams out of Santa Clara, not Arkansas. Jalen Williams is a guard, awesome with the ball in his hands, killer in the pick and roll. I love his feel. I love his playmaking ability. I love his size. I love his shiftiness. He reminds me a little bit of a more in control Kevin Porter Jr. I don't know if he's as big a bucket as Kevin Porter Jr. is, but he has a similar type game. And I think that, you know, you get a guy like that at the back end of the first round in this range. I think ultimately size, skill, feel, these are things that the NBA is training towards. And he's a guy that I would bet on uh, coming into the league that carves himself a role as, as a guy who can make plays as a secondary, maybe tertiary ball handler, maybe off your bench, maybe in a, a, a lineup with uh, playing off your stars. So I really like Jalen Williams. I think he's a sleeper. He had a really great year this year. Peyton Watson had a very forgettable year at UCLA this year. He came in top 10 height and he just didn't live up to it call it opportunity, call it the fact that he's raw and he wasn't ready, but there's just something about him that I think the kid is going to be a big time NBA player. I think defensively he is going to be a monster. The shot, major question mark, but I think that he's going to be able to show in the NBA that he could play with the ball in his hands a little bit more often. I think when he got the opportunity to play in the games, he showed these flashes that were just so intriguing. I couldn't take my eyes off of them. You know, he was playing on a veteran team with Hani Hawkes Jr. and Johnny Juzang and a team that really had aspirations to make it to another Final Four. But uh, he didn't get his shine. And whether he goes back to school and builds off that and, and kind of shows who he is next year or he enters the draft and he kind of shows out in workouts and a team takes a chance on him, I think he's a really high potential guy. And back into the first round, I'm swinging on his athleticism and just his ability to fit into the modern NBA as this 6'8", 6 6'9", Six, nine, multi-tool, versatile, swing up and down, defend up and down. I, I just like his skill set and I'm willing to bet on him long term. At 28, I have Kennedy Chandler out of Tennessee. Chandler was a guy who started out as like a lotto prospect, dropped down to a lot of rankings, had him out of the first round entirely, and then he had a strong close to the season, and he's brought himself back into the first round conversation and maybe even can sneak his way back into the lottery if the right team who needs a point guard um, is looking for one. So uh, Chandler is a guy, I love the pace that he plays with, man. He's, there's just such a poise and control in which he plays, and at 19, 20 years old, I mean, it's really Really super impressive. There are going to be question marks about the shot. You know, he went really cold in the middle of the season, but he started out and ended the year shooting really well. And his height is going to be a question mark. He's got a good wingspan. So defensively, I think he'll be okay, but he's not a guy that's going to be able to swing up and guard, you know, threes and fours. He's really just going to be able to guard backcourt positions. And it's probably going to be a struggle if he has to guard some bigger twos. So, um, you know, I just think that the way that the modern NBA is going where, you know, size and versatility is, is valued, he's a guy that I think could slip to the back end of the first round, but he's definitely a lottery type talent. And um, I think context is really going to be a big part in how successful he is, you know, his first, second year in the league and, and who he, what team he goes to, who he's playing behind or in front of. So Kennedy Chandler is a guy who I really can't wait to watch grow in the NBA. At number 27, I have Justin Lewis out of Marquette. 6'8", six, 6'9", six, stocky, strong, tree trunk legs, can shoot the three. Just a guy that I could see having like a, uh, a Markeith, Marcus Morris type impact in the league where he's guarding, you know, power forwards, maybe could switch onto some perimeter guys, can probably even bang in the post a little bit because he's got really strong core. Um, but it's the three ball at that size. I think he could attack closeouts. You know, if the playmaking ever comes around, maybe we're having a conversation where he's a little bit more than just a, a, a role player, but I think he could be a really high end role player on really good teams. So if a team at the back end of the first round, a Miami Heat, for instance, get their hands on this guy, I would be really scared. At number 26, I have Max Christie. As you can tell, guys like Peyton Watson, Max Christie, 
these are eye test guys. And I, when I look at Christy, I see the smoothness, I see the size, I see the jump shot, even if the percentages didn't play out the way you wish that they did. He's a guy he might go back to. And if he does, I expect that he might be able to have this really impactful second sophomore year where you know he maybe is gonna shoot himself up into a top 10 conversation. But I would bet on this kid. I just love the way that he moves on the floor. There's a smoothness, a silkiness to his game. And again, even though that shot didn't drop, his shot is so pretty. There's no way I don't see him being a good shooter in the NBA. And I think he's got some off the bounce stuff that he didn't really get to show all that much at Michigan State. So I'm a big uh, proponent of Max Christie. I would take him even higher than this, you know, dependent on the team drafting. Um, so I could understand the arguments as to why some people would have him out of the first round entirely. I totally get it, but I'm willing to bet on what my eyes saw, and I really liked what I saw from Christie this year, even if the shots weren't dropping. At number 25, first of two Ohio State guys, EJ Liddell. I really like EJ Liddell. I think he's got a little bit of modern Paul Millsap to his game. The shot got way better this year, more consistent. The shot blocking took a huge leap and he's made some really quick, explosive shot blocks this year. And even though he's only like 6'7", he's got long arms, he's smart, intelligent. I, I like how tough he is. He's got a little mid-range game. He can do a little something something in the post. I like this kid's game. I think he's gonna be a, a guy who could go on to a, you know some veteran team and give them spot minutes and contribute immediately as his game grows. At number 24, this is a guy that I do think is going to be a big time riser. I could see him being a surprise lottery guy come draft night. Malachi Branham, Ohio State, second Ohio State guy back to back. Um, he ultimately might move up on my board by the time the draft comes too. I love his ability to play with the ball in his hands. I love how he's patient and poised in the pick and roll. His jump shot, silky smooth. Just, uh, I love how he can shoot on or off the ball. He's always shot ready. I, I really enjoy this kid's game. He came out of nowhere and um, he's not loud. You know, he's he doesn't have a ton of flashy dunks. His game is just, he's kind of Chris middleton -y in that way. So I, I think that he's a guy that's gonna be a big time riser come workouts and interviews and whatnot. You're gonna start hearing his name a little bit more coming, uh, coming soon. At number 23, I have Jaden Hardy. He's probably been the hardest evaluation for me throughout the year. Uh, he was my preseason number one, so obviously big time drop. And Hardy's a guy that struggled in the G League um, and he made strides up until the end of the G League season. So, you know, the trajectory he's on was a positive one, but, you know, he still has things that he needs to work on. He, he still needs to work on his feel. His handle's still a little bit loose. The shot didn't, you know, drop as much as you wished it would, a lot like Christie. The percentages don't exactly match what the eye test tells you, but there's a lot to like. You know, he's a guy that I think is really good playing without the ball, where it's just moving, coming off flares, pin downs, floppy. And if he goes to the right situation, I think he's a guy that can have a buddy heel like impact. And, you know, maybe I thought he was going to be more Bradley Beal coming into the year, but hey, Buddy Heald got paid a lot of money to put the ball in the hole, shoot a lot of threes, and he's damn good at it. So I think Jaden Hardy can have a similar career. And if he does that, he is going to be very, very worthy of a top 10 lottery selection. All right, at number 22, this is a guy that I do think is going to ultimately end up going back, but whose game I absolutely love, Dalen Terry from Arizona. This kid got the opportunity to come in and play big minutes towards the end of the season when Kirk Krisha, uh hurt his ankle. And I'm telling you, this guy's made for the modern NBA. 6'7", passing feel. If you cut back door, this dude will find you. His jump shot looks pretty okay. Definitely needs improvement, but he shot it at a pretty decent clip. Uh, I just love his energy. I love how he looks with the ball in his hands at his size. I mean, that's what you want in the modern NBA. A multi-tool ball handler who could guard multiple positions, get up and down the court and knock down spot up shots. Seems like he's gonna be able to fit in anywhere. Um, the team just had this energy when he was in the game and playing with the ball in his hands. And I, I think this kid is gonna be a stud. At number 21, I have Ty Ty Washington out of Kentucky. Ty Ty, man, there's a lot, a lot of people are either in on him or they're out on him. I'm somewhere in the middle. I think Ty Ty is a really good basketball player. I love his float game. I love his pull up midi. It's deadly. I mean, I, I like that he showed that when he had the opportunity to play point guard, he was able to have an, a 17 assist game. That's big time. I think he's got the length to defend in the NBA. Um, you know, his rim pressure needs some work here and there, right? He's not super explosive, but I think he's going to be a guy that's just so solid. And when we look back, like he's probably going to be too low in these rankings, but 
I I'm betting on the potential of some of the other guys ahead of him. And uh, Ty Ty Washington, uh, he... He's going to make some GM look really smart if they can get him, you know, outside the lottery or even in the back end of the lottery. At number 20, I have Gabriel Prichita. He's probably one of my favorite international prospects in this class. Uh, Prochita is an Italian kid who really reminds me of like a Bogdan Bogdanovich, just 6'7", can shoot the crap out of the ball. Great frame, strong. And the thing I love most about him, though, he might be the bounciest prospect in this entire class. This kid has a vendetta against the rim. He gets violent there. His putbacks are special. I love this kid's game, and I just think he's going to be such an easy fit on so many NBA rosters. I mean, big shooters who are athletic, like, come on, you could slot that in anywhere, and you put him next to a LeBron. You put him next to a Luka, a KD. Like, this kid's going to eat, and uh, he's a guy that because of the college season not that many international prospects get this you know all this hype he's a guy that is going to be slept on but i'm telling you this kid is going to be a player in the nba at number 19 i have jan montero of the overtime elite uh montero is a guy his stock has really fallen again another guy who was like 10 to 14 range coming into the season but he's fallen pretty much out of the first round but I do think his performance at the Nike Hoop Summit earlier this week uh, will do a lot for his stock going forward. But he's a kid who's just sick with the ball in his hands. He's got a shifty handle. He can shoot it off the bounce. I, I mean, he, he's very creative as a passer. So even if he doesn't find himself in a starter role, I think he could be a really high impact microwave playmaker off the bench. And um, even though he didn't get to play in the, the same kind of conditions as some of his uh, counterparts did this, this draft cycle, and that muddied his draft stock a little bit, I do think that he is well worth a pick anywhere from 14 to 20. At number 18, might be my favorite prospect in the whole draft, Ryan Rollins out of Toledo. This kid is so freaking smooth, 6'4", shooting guard, long arms, reminds me a lot of like shooting guard Brandon Ingram, you know, not getting the love because he played for a mid-major, but I think that this kid is going to be big time in the league. One of two 19-year-olds up until Johnny Davis turned 20 to average 19 points a game this season, so uh, even as a sophomore, he's still young. I, the kid is just a bucket man, I mean, violent crossovers, step backs, the, the skill and footwork and timing in the mid post. I mean, it's very Devin Booker-esque as well. I love this kid's game. I'm super stoked that he declared for the draft recently. And I think this kid is going to be a big time riser come draft time. At number 17, I have Tari Eason. Tari Eason from LSU. I mean, just uh, modern NBA, versatile wing, man. Like long arms, strong, 6'8", six, 6'9", six, can handle. Shot came along, ended up shooting 36% on the year. Finishes at the rim. He he can pass a little bit and he can defend multiple positions. Absolute stock monster. His advanced numbers were crazy. He's a little bit old for a sophomore, but you know, we don't age shame on this channel. And uh, I think that he's a guy that is going to be able to slot in and maybe one day down the line when he's developed a little bit, you know, and come into his own in the league and gotten a feel for the league, he's going to be the guy that you put on Paul George. He's the guy that you put on DeMar DeRozan, Luca, the guys that, you know, play with the ball in their hands a lot. So I think that's really valuable. And if you can get that right outside the lottery, it's a home run. Number 16, this is a guy that really, really started the year off poorly. His year was going pretty similarly to like Peyton Watson, not getting a lot of playing time, not looking confident, but he has arrived. Usman Jang from the New Zealand Breakers. Man, 6'10", can shoot it. The playmaking feels crazy. Long arms. Uh, the touch on the floaters is coming around. He's been balling lately in New Zealand in a pro league, and that means something. So even though he started off slowly, progress he's made is tremendous. And I'm really starting to get on board. You know, I, he's a guy that the stats are going to mislead you because you have to watch his film to really understand, you know, how much potential this kid has at such a young age, at his size. I, I think he could be a big time player, man. And I think if he goes outside the lottery, you know, he's one of those home run swings that you look back on, you know, down the line in this in, in the draft world. And you go, how did everybody miss on it? So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how NBA teams value him. A team like OKC might take a swing on him because the kid is just oozing potential. And uh, I'm a huge, huge fan. I'm finally riding the Jang train. At number 15, I have Mark Williams from Duke. I've been riding for Mark Williams from the start. What I love about Mark Williams' game is the simplicity, man. He's going to catch lobs. He's going to collect the garbage 
putbacks, offensive rebounds. He's going to run in transition, and he's going to defend. He's going to be scheme versatile. He's going to be able to do a whole bunch of things. Really simple, easy to slot in. And if you put him with a guy like a LaMelo Ball who could throw him lobs, floor spacers who are going to allow him to kind of do his job and clean up the glass, you need somebody to anchor your defense. He's one of the best in the business. So... I'm a big fan of Mark Williams. I think he's a guy that is going to be bordering on that lottery territory, and uh, he's deserving because he had a monster year at Duke. At number 14, I have Jeremy Suhan from Baylor. The epitome of the modern NBA, man. I mean, this is a kid who's going to be able to switch one through five. He's got playmaking feel in the short roll. He showed a little bit off the bounce here and there. He reminds me a little bit of Patrick Williams. You know, I don't think he's got the same shooting touch that Patrick Williams had at Florida State, but he's shown a little bit of the same stuff, and he came off the bench, so I think his production was a little bit hidden. I think that he's a guy that ultimately is probably going to wow a team in workouts and in interviews, and, you know, he's got this uh, international tape, too that he has that, that teams are going to be able to go back and look at and see what he could do when he has the ball in his hands a little bit more often. I'm a huge fan of Suhan. He's got the best hair in the draft. Um, and I just love what he's going to be able to bring to every single NBA team. At number 13, I have national champion, final four, most outstanding player, Ochai Agbaji from Kansas. Uh, Agbaji was one of the most impressive prospects that I saw live this season. I've seen probably a third of the top 60-ish guys live and I uh, saw him against Michigan State early in the year. The kid was ready from the jump and, you know, it showed they won a national championship. That poise, that leadership, that experience and the skill, you know, he could shoot it from three and not just stand still, man. This is a guy that you're going to be able to run off movement. Um, this is a guy who he's going to use his shooting to accentuate his cutting and he's dumb athletic this dude will flush it he's gonna catch some lobs and catch some bodies so i i Agbaji is a guy that i think he's gonna be a, a, an amazing role player he's not gonna be a guy that has the ball in his hands and is you know running a ton of high ball screens but when given the opportunity he'll come off the screen and hit a little pull up you know he'll, he'll be able to do a little bit of that and i think he's a guy that's gotten better every year he'll continue to get better and he's gonna make a major impact on a franchise regardless of the fact that he is a senior all right, at number 12, I have Patrick Baldwin Jr. Again, I'm going on eye test versus stats. His shooting production was not good, but the shot looks great. He's huge. He's got some playmaking feel. And I just think that when you take him out of being a number one option and you put him around some star players, I think he's going to go back to where he's comfortable, where the attention isn't all on him as a, a ball handler and as a scorer. And he's going to be able to do what he does, taking advantage of second side defenders and spot up shooting and just being just like an ultimate toolsy role player. You know, I don't know if he has the mentality to be that number one guy and playing at Milwaukee in this terrible situation he had this year, he showed that that's something that he's gonna struggle with. But you know, what, what's the conversation like if he had gone to Duke and he was playing off Paulo and he was playing off AJ Griffin and you know, Jeremy Roach, Trevor Keels, and all these guys, and he was just able to catch and shoot and get out and transition and, you know, take advantage of easy buckets. You know, what's the conversation like? Is he still in the five, six, seven range? Maybe. I don't know. But I'm not giving up on him as a lottery prospect because I, I think it's rare for guys to have that kind of shooting ability at that size. So uh, I'm willing to go back through his high school tape, his FIBA tape, and kind of realize what kind of player he is and stick with him as a lottery guy. At number 11, I have Johnny Davis, Wisconsin. Burst onto the scene, probably the highest rise out of any player in the draft, going from basically, you know, off all of the, the top 60s to being a potential top 10 pick. When you watch him, you see the shades of Devin Booker. I see a shorter Joe Johnson, just a smooth, tough, shot maker. I think he's quicker and more athletic than he's given credit for. I think he's going to show to be a little bit better of a playmaker than he's given credit for. And he's a worker who knows what it takes to get to this position because he wasn't supposed to be a top 10 pick this year. Um, I think the FIBA experience really helped him come into his own and he was just big time at Wisconsin this year, man. So I, I love Johnny Davis. I love what he brings. I love his mentality. And I think that he's a guy that is probably going to score 20 plus points in, in the league for a long time. At number 10, I have Benedict Matherin. Matherin's a guy that I was high on coming into the year. He's pretty much stayed steadily around 10 for me. 
throughout this whole process. I just, I love his athleticism. I love his ability to shoot it. I thought that he played really well for Team Canada in the FIBA tournament where he got to show a little bit more with the ball in his hands. And I think he's got some potential to grow his game when he gets to the NBA with more space. Allowed, if he's allowed to play with the ball in his hands, maybe he's got a little bit of like Victor Oladipo to his game. But I, I even if he doesn't show the stuff with the ball in his hands, you can slot him almost anywhere in the league due to his athleticism, his shot. And if the off the bounce stuff does come around, the dude is going to be a major, major problem and probably a multiple time all-star. At number nine, I have Dyson Daniels from the G League Ignite. He was the G League Ignite guy I was most impressed with on game one, and he's the guy that I'm most impressed with now that their season has ended. He's 6'8", he can handle the ball. He shot it way better towards the end of the season um, from NBA three-point line. You know, take that into account. I, I love his pace. I love, you know, just all the winning plays that he does, tipping, tip dunks, deflections, just the little things. I love his feel. And he's a guy that like he could play in a lineup with another point guard. He could that he could play off of. He could play as the primary ball handler. He can play with your superstar guys. He could play as a role player. Um, I think that he's just gonna be versatile. He's gonna have a major impact on winning wherever he goes. And, and he's a guy that is just representative of the modern NBA. Big, versatile, defend multiple positions, knock down shots. At number eight, I have Jalen Duran from Memphis. I love this kid's game. I love his potential. And let us not forget that he was supposed to be a senior in high school this year. He looks like an absolute man right now. As a 18 year old kid, newly turned 18, um, I thought throughout the year, his playmaking improved. He looks really good in the short roll, and this is where you're starting to see those BAM comparisons. I thought his motor started running hotter to where it was something that people questioned coming into the year. I thought his, like, he consistently played hard throughout the end of the year. And look, in the NBA, size, strength, athleticism, it does matter. You know, you want the, the skills, you want the feel, and I think those are things that he's shown that he has, but he has tools that you can't teach. And Jalen Duran is a monster man-child, and I think that he is going to be a phenomenal fit for one of these lottery teams who lets him grow into himself, and ultimately, a couple years down the line, you're gonna see the payoff. At number seven, I have Keegan Murray. Uh, Keegan Murray was a guy who, when I saw him live, he was more locked in than any other prospect that I had seen um, throughout this draft cycle. Uh, I think that he is such a good fit for the modern NBA. Every time he went out on the floor, he went out to dominate. Some people are going to have a sour taste in their mouth because of how he went out in the tournament, but, but let's pump the brakes. Remember how some people overreacted to Franz Wagner's last game in the tournament? This kid had a phenomenal year. You know, he's a little older as a sophomore, but he dominated. And at first it was, well, he's dominating uh, non-conference competition. Then he dominated Big Ten competition. So the kid is just a baller, man. His shot looked awesome throughout the entire year. He's awesome in transition. The kid can do it in the half court. I think that he is going to just be a phenomenal Swiss Army knife tool at the NBA level. And I think that he's a guy that is going to ultimately, you know, he's getting mocked there now. He's a guy that might be in the top five conversation. At number six, I have AJ Griffin from Duke. I've loved AJ's game since he was in high school. You know, what a devastating backcourt he and RJ Davis was for high school kids. But, I, you know, he's a guy that really reminds me of Jimmy Butler, Jalen Brown, that kind of wing. I think that obviously the shooting is the first thing you think of now, but like that's not what he was when he came in. People thought of him as like this athletic slasher. And he didn't really get to show that a lot this year at Duke where he was kind of playing off the ball because Duke had so many ball handlers and he kind of had come in mid-season into the midst of it, you know, after he was recovering from his knee injury and whatnot. So right now you see a guy who could play off the ball and space the floor. And you see a guy that I think has potential to play on the ball and really grow his game as an isolation scorer. And he's shown flashes of doing that throughout the year where you're just like, oh my God, this kid looks the part, man. And his he's got the body. He's one of the youngest prospects in the class. You know, it wouldn't shock me if he was one of the three best players from this draft when things are all said and done. So I'm really high on AJ Griffin and he is my number six prospect. At number five, the mystery man of the draft, Shaden Sharp out of Kentucky. Now look, I, I'm gonna be honest. When you are projecting a high school kid forward, there are challenges. You know, I mentioned earlier, Jaden Hardy was my number one prospect coming into the year because he looked so good against high school competition. And Shaden Sharp, he looks the same way. And he doesn't have a lot of major competition uh, under his belt. You know, he just doesn't have that high level experience. But the film, it really pops, man. This kid's game is silky smooth. He is a monster athlete. 
the shot is ridiculous. The combo moves that this kid busts out, the skill in which he does it and how effortless it looks, it's ridiculous. And uh, he's got a long way to go on the defensive end. There's no doubt about that. He's going to need to be coached up. There are things to his game that he needs to work on, but his raw tools are out of this world. And again, the shot making, the range, the silkiness, it's it's ridiculous. I think he's going to be a guy that a team swings on early, and it could really be a grand slam if they do. At number four, and you know, next week if you ask me, he might be number three, he might be number two, but right now he's number four, Jabari Smith Jr. from Auburn, uh, 6'10", absolute sniper. He had one of the most amazing shooting seasons for a guy 6'10 ever in college, and that thing looks smooth, man. That's going to translate, and that's going to be a day one skill that he has to bring to a team defensively. He's going to be able to guard the perimeter, switch out onto, onto guards and guard bigs. He's going to, he's everything you want in like the modern day four. But you know, he's also being billed as this guy who maybe is a little bit oversold as a full package scorer. You know, his self-creation ability is a little bit rudimentary right now. He's going to jab step you and just shoot over you but he doesn't have a ton of creativity on the wing. His ball handling is a little shaky, it's a little loose. It's not gonna stop him from being an awesome player because at the end of the day, when you can shoot it that well and you can defend that well, you're gonna find a role. I've always said, and it it sounds like it's not a compliment, but he's kind of like a modern day Taj Gibson, Joe Smith to me. And those guys had really long careers. Joe Smith was num number one pick back in the day. Uh, but there's something about Jabari Smith that I just, it wouldn't shock me if he develops the ball handling because of the worker, because of his age. But there's something as a self-creator that I'm willing to bet on with some of the other guys ahead of him. But again, you asked me this in a couple of days, you could talk me into Jabari Smith being the best prospect long-term. At number three, I have Jaden Ivey. Uh, saw Jaden Ivey live. The athleticism is jaw-dropping in person. I mean, the kid is just an absolute blur. He's got the bounce. And I think when you put him into an NBA context with all of that extra space, it's going to be a nightmare for defenses to figure out how to guard. You know, you see what guys like Ja, and I know that Ja is the, you know, the, the comp that everybody goes to, but I kind of think he plays a little bit like Zach Levine and Zach Levine's athleticism and the way that he's able to get to his spot so easily is something that I think that Jaden Ivey can emulate as well. I think the jump shot obviously looks good. It went in at a good clip and he just had moments where he was able to take over games in a way that you just look at perimeter players in the NBA and go, this guy's got it. So uh, I think that he's going to be a guy that it's given the freedom to have the ball in his hands more at the next level. You know, he played a lot off of his bigs at Purdue. And if you put the ball in his hands, let him play in the pick and roll, I think he's going to be even more devastating. It's going to show his playmaking flashes more at the NBA level. You know, maybe he's going to have some growing pains. You look at guys like Anthony Edwards and Jalen Green, and you see how the last few years they started their rookie year, they were struggling, and then they figured it out as the year closed and they went on these monster runs. It wouldn't shock me if Jaden Ivey had a similar trajectory, but... I think he's big time and just his tools are so special that he's got to be the top guard in this class. At number two, I have Paulo Boncaro out of Duke. Paulo's a guy I've gone back and forth with, man, because talent wise, he should be the number one player in the draft. And there are times he looks like the number one player in the draft. 6'10", 250, can handle the ball on a string. He showed that he could shoot it in, you know, either off the catch or off the bounce. The playmaking ability, he's able to swallow up defenders when he wants to. He's even shown the ability to rotate over and make plays on the help side. But that's when he wants to. My thing with Paolo is that he doesn't always bring it. It was a story in high school and it was a story at Duke. You know, I saw him twice this year at the beginning of the season against Kentucky where he looked amazing and uh, at the end of the season in the ACC tournament against Miami where he had some moments where he looked fantastic and he looked like the number one guy and then there were other times he just looked like he wasn't giving effort. So what kind of guy are you going to get in the next level? Is he just going to all of a sudden be a guy who goes balls to the wall for 48 minutes? I don't know history says probably not but his talent is so overwhelming that if he decides to put it together for 35 minutes a night he's going to be the best player in the draft and he has that potential so it's a scary proposition passing on him but you also might be passing on one of these other guys in the top four that maybe you're going to put it together and he's a guy that you're always going to want you know want more out of but there's no way after what he did in the tournament, I could have him any lower than two because he really started to show what it looks like when he does put it together for these long stretches. And at number one, he's been my number one guy all year. You're gonna yell at me in the comments and tell me that Chet is too skinny, that he's not gonna be able to stop Jokic and Embiid. 
spoiler alert, I don't think Jalen Duran's gonna stop Jokic and Embiid. You're gonna tell me that he's gonna break down. Guess what? I think you're wrong. I think that he is going to be able to handle the physicality of the NBA because he's tough as shit. I think that he's super skilled. I think the NBA is about skill, length, and IQ. And I think he has that in spades. He put together one of the best college seasons from an advanced metrics perspective uh, in recent memory up there with Zion and Anthony Davis. And I think that if you just watch him, the eye test, he looks dominant at times. Yeah, he played in a, tour in a conference that people think isn't that competitive. But this year, it was, and he played games against a lot of strong competition in non-conference play. He was able to, to body up Jalen Duran in the NCAA tournament too. So there are question marks, right? What's that self-creation ability gonna look like at the next level? Is it gonna look more like college where things were jumbled up or is it gonna look like high school? But I'm gonna bet on the ability that when Chet enters his prime to be a defensive player of the year candidate every year, along with opening up your offense, shooting it around 40% from three, making smart passes, smart reads, and using the extra space that the NBA provides to create a little bit more than he did in college. I'm taking that bet. I'm taking Chet Holmgren. I think that this kid has won everywhere he's been. He's looked apart everywhere he's been. He doesn't have an injury history. And I'm taking Chet Holmgren, number one in the 2022 NBA draft. Thank you for watching, sticking with me. If you have any questions about guys that were outside of my top 30, hit me up below, ask about a certain player, and I'll give you my opinion on them. Again, I want you to tell me what you disagreed with and tell me what you agreed with. Just try to be cordial in those comments, y'all. Um, if you want daily NBA draft content delivered to your email inbox for free, subscribe to noceilingsnba.com, Monday through Friday, written content. You can check out the Draft Deck NBA Draft Podcast anywhere podcasts are available. And as always, if you haven't yet, please like and subscribe to the channel for more premium NBA Draft content.